Okay, we're back live in San Francisco. I'm John Furrier with SiliconAngle.com. I'm here with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org. We're here with Jason Nolet, who uh, is the VP of the Data Center and uh, Enterprise Networking Business at Brocade. Jason, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks. First time. Glad to be here. Right. <laughs> it's awesome. Pleasure to see you. So, um, SANS, LANS, IP, it's all going crazy. You know, actually, it's interesting, Fiber Channel, I know, has been a little, little boon for you guys lately. It's been bumping up. I thought Fiber Channel was dead. What's going no, on? No, that business is alive and well. I mean, customers appreciate, uh, you know, five or six nines of reliability and the fact that it's proven in 90% of uh, Global 1000 data centers. And so, it's a very, very sticky technology with a lot of loyalty, and we continue to grow that business, and customers love it. But a lot changing in networking, right? People talk about north, south, east, west. Talk about what's changed in the last five to 10 years. Yeah, well, you mentioned uh, you know, change in traffic patterns. Obviously, uh, data center networks have historically been built for client-server traffic patterns. A lot of north, south, client makes a request, server gets it, spits out the response. All of that is changing with virtualization in the data center, and we're seeing uh, a real transition to east-west traffic, and the question is, what kind of a network do you need for east-west traffic? Well, you need a network that's built for server-to-server -server communications. And this is where you know, our offering in uh, VCS Fabrics and Ethernet Fabric technology in our VDX switching product line, this is part of the VSpecs uh, offering that was announced today, is purpose-built for that environment, purpose-built to um, foster the notion of server-to-server -server, server communication based on things like VM mobility, uh, based on things like the disaggregation of applications that used to be monolithic running on one physical server, now componentized, running across a number of different servers that creates a lot of inter-process communication traffic that is east-west and you need a network built for that. So, talk a little bit more about your point of view on converged infrastructure. Sort of, you know, VCE got it started, you know, a couple years ago and then the whole market's exploded. So, how has Brocade participated in that and where do you see it going? Well, I think the announcement that was made today is a, is a perfect offer for uh, the market that kind of balances the notion of pre-validated, proven solutions, but maintaining some flexibility and some choice for the customer. So where I think some customers may prefer to get that fully locked down, single SKU kind of converged stack, I think more customers are going to appreciate the benefits of a VSpecs-like offering. It gives them the flexibility of choice, best of breed componentry, and a much broader you know, set of uh, technologies to choose from as they're building these data center environments. Well, we've quantified it um, on Wikibon. We just did a study, and I'll share this with you. Mark, I don't know if you can pull it up again. It's, uh, it's figure one. So in fact, if you look at the, uh, the market, John, for converged infrastructure, it's $400 billion TAM. Now that includes everything, servers and networking and storage and services and infrastructure management software. The biggest piece of that is what we call reference architectures. Right. You know, which is what you talked about today. Exactly. It's, it's, I mean, these guys might not like us calling it a reference architecture, but essentially it's that, you know, we would define it as such. It's the, the choice, the proven solution, the sure. tested, and, and, you know, and, and that's really probably four to five times larger uh, than Agreed. the single yeah. SKU market. So uh, you're obviously agreeing with that. Yeah, the same thing. absolutely. The other thing I'd say about it is that it's a much more channel friendly offer than the single SKU approach. Right, the single SKU approach runs the risk of kind of disenfranchising the channel because they used to bring systems integration capabilities to that offer. Um, I think the reference architecture, the VSpecs kind of offer, gives the channel a greater opportunity to consult in that choice, to help the customer size the deployment, help them choose the best in breed componentry, and really brings them back into the fold in terms of being an advisor to their customers. Yeah, I mean, the single SKU business today is, is a lot of large deals, obviously, and that's cool. Um, especially for customers that you know are comfortable with that and can maybe do with some of the integration you know, on their own, but the smaller and mid-sized businesses you know, don't have that capabilities. We had a number of channel partners on today talking about the services opportunity, John, and that's been a, a huge boom. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to, like to talk about more of that purpose-built. We've been hearing that going way back to our discussion around Oracle versus SAP and the choice, and we're seeing more and more purpose-built solutions out there. A lot of integrated components. We heard from uh, Citrix earlier, um, uh, she been in the business for years, and talking about how the, the building blocks to build these solutions are harder and harder. Now with these purpose-built products, now purpose-built architectures uh, is opening up. So I'd like to get your opinion. What behind machine to machine do you see as the other opportunities for these purpose-built uh, products? 
Well, I think there's a number of specialized applications that like you know, the notion of a purpose-built product or purpose-built stack. And in fact, when I talk to customers about their choice around the, you know, the single SKU architecture versus the reference architecture, what I hear is the single SKU architecture is appropriate for some applications that would benefit from you know, that kind of environment. But on the, on the kind of the flip side of that is the notion of vendor lock-in. If they're, if they're going to build broadly their IT infrastructure based on only purpose-built and fully converged infrastructure, it doesn't leave them a lot of choice. And it, and it creates a, a vendor lock-in scenario that they're afraid of, right? It's one of the rubs that we're starting to hear about blade servers today, is that blade servers are not as flexible for the customer in the end because it's not as easy to repurpose a blade on a server as it is a you know, one U rack server that can be deployed in a variety of other, other areas. So, so I think we're going to see more and more offers like vSpecs that are giving the customer the choice and, and, and we're going to see purpose-built infrastructure that is specialized for a given use case or a, a given application. Yeah, so, you know, lock-in is nuanced, right? Um, and I think a lot of customers that I talk to say it's about pricing power. Um, they're afraid of the single SKU solution because sure. they're afraid that while it's alluring that they're going to lose their pricing power. What a lot of companies are doing, and you're seeing this with, I mean, certainly VCE is very aggressive, Exadata with Oracle, they'll put white glove service around there, and right. we know what that's all about. It's a land grab, and, and you know, hey, the same thing's probably going to happen with vSpecs. Uh, we were at IBM yesterday, and they said, we're not going to charge a premium for our converged solution, you know, their integrated solution. So, over time, there's a value, however, I guess I would, I would argue, and I'd love your point of view on this, for integration. So, over time, shouldn't customers expect to pay more for integration, especially if it's going to cut their labor costs? Well, I think you know it depends on the form of integration you're talking about. If if it's a fully converged integrated stack without a lot of choice and componentry, then I think it certainly feels good up front as you're deploying that more quickly than you would if you had to string it all together yourself. But in the long run, you're going to suffer from the vendor lock-in you described. You're going to suffer from lack of pricing flexibility and leverage. I think there's also a kind of a less subtle impact there, and that's around innovation. If you think about what drives innovation today, it's the ability for any vendor to come to the table at any place in the stack and deliver something that's innovative or differentiating. It's unlikely that any one vendor, even the big guys, will be able to innovate at every layer in the stack. So locking up that entire stack under one vendor's you know, brand, I think, could harm innovation. It's better to leave that open, the way vSpecs does, uh, and give vendors the opportunity to integrate and innovate at any point in the stack. Yeah, that's a trade-off. You know, Stu Miniman talks about this a lot in terms of a lot of customers are on different cycles. They, they buy the storage or the lease it sometimes, you know, on a three-year cycle, and they've got their servers on a different cycle and networking maybe on a different cycle. You're seeing right. that as well. Absolutely. Yeah, so something yeah. like this will allow you to maybe, okay, I'll take this piece now and I can bring these pieces then and sure. then maybe, maybe give me some time to sync it up, learn about the technology yeah. and then start rolling it out. That's, it's time. a great point because refresh cycles don't come in a kind of, you know, I'm going to refresh my entire infrastructure top to bottom. You're typically going to refresh, you know, portions of the infrastructure. It might be the network, it might be the storage, and I think again a vSpecs like offering gives the customer the flexibility to go change out a component or a layer in that stack without having to change out the whole stack. So what else is changing here? I mean, you know, we, we've, we've, John, over the years, we've talked a lot about you know, fiber channel over at Ethernet as a form of convergence. Um, you guys are big in the fiber channel space. You know, what are you seeing there, and what's changing in well, your? Well, actually, in your Intel business? brought up this. We were talking about. We always been talking about fiber channel as a systems component, and Intel. Yeah. Jim was on talking about the systems concept, and the data center obviously is now a system. I mean, I wrote a post called operating system, but I mean, you can look at it as an operating system. Sure. But at the end of the day, customers have to make it work in a coherent system. So. That's kind of where we were getting this notion of, hey, you know, there's, there's spots for tech that by itself may look old, and, and, but if they perform well in the scheme of the new operating system. So with that, with Fiber Channel, for example, what scope of new architectures are out there that you see kind of a changing of the perception or the, and the reality of what's viable in the data center? Well, I guess, you know, it just may be tying it to Fiber Channel. I would say there's a number of emerging technologies that I think are quite favorable to the continued deployment of Fiber Channel. And you take flash uh, storage, for example. You know, customers or companies putting flash storage into arrays means the storage network must perform to a level that ensures that the network doesn't become a bottleneck and essentially neuter the value of the flash uh, portion of the array. Fiber Channel is perfectly suited for that, right? We've just released, uh, just a, you know, about a half a year ago, our latest generation fiber channel technology, 16 gig technology, that ups the ante in terms of bandwidth, ups the ante in terms of latency and IO performance. Um, so as, you're, as customers are deploying these emerging technologies like SSD, you need a network that's going to keep pace, otherwise it becomes a bottleneck. Yeah, so David Floyer's written a lot about this, our, our CTO at Wikibon, 
about the whole I.O. architecture uh, changing. And, and Jim Blakely from Intel also talked about it. We're seeing new applications really take advantage of, uh, of this, uh, this structure. You're certainly seeing it from the, the big guys like you know, Google and Facebook and, and the like. Are you starting to see it in the enterprise yet? I think we're seeing some of that in the enterprise. I mean, the, the number of customers that can go out and kind of build their own, you know, and, and roll their own architecture and their own componentry is pretty small. Um, you have to be a very big enterprise with a lot of resources to go do that. So I think it's still a limited number of companies that are doing this kind of thing. But clearly the move to some form of private cloud architecture has really taken hold. I think all of the hype is, uh, you know, dissipated and people are seeing some real value there. And that's where we think, you know, we've got network infrastructure in the form of Ethernet fabrics and in the form of continued investment in fiber channel that's very well suited for those private cloud architectures. Yeah, so you've got your, um, Brocade has its feet in both camps with the acquisition of Foundry. I mean, it's, you know, you're clearly now playing in the I IP network space. How's that all shaking out? Talk about oh, that a little it's, bit. It's terrific because what we've done with Ethernet fabrics in particular is we've taken the best of the technology from the fiber channel space, and I'm being very specific here around both ASIC technology and software technology, combined it with new emerging standards in Ethernet, some of which we got with the Foundry acquisition, things like Trill as a replacement for spanning tree and data center bridging for lossless Ethernet, combine those two things into this new technology, this new architecture we're calling Ethernet Fabrics. Yeah, I mean, um, you guys obviously have a deep heritage. Fiber channel is hard, you know, and, uh, and, and that's your core. You know, at the same time, <laughs> the world's going to Ethernet. So, um, and FCOE plays into that, uh, but there's an interesting schism going on in the marketplace. Yet, at the same time, we talked about the top of this, uh, this interview, Fiber Channel recently has popped up. Why? Why is that? Well, I think the, um, the hype around FCOE has largely dissipated along with the value. Um, and that is there's just not a lot of companies who are interested in, in kind of disrupting the core of their data center environments, the core of Fiber Channel SANS, to take the chance on a technology like FCOE. So while we invested very heavily in FCOE technology and we continue to be you know, a proponent, the reality is there's not a lot of adoption. There's almost no adoption of FCOE end to end. There's some adoption from the server to the first top of the network at the top of rack. Um, but, um, but the reality is fiber channel works. It's reliable, it's highly performant, um, it's low overhead in terms of managing those networks, and so there's not a lot of reason to displace it, and customers continue to invest. Well, you talk to customers, they don't, you know, they don't want to make change. Sure. They just don't, but I mean, at some point, isn't it inevitable? I mean, it's the cable bulk just gets too big, right? I mean. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at the studies that have been done around the potential cost savings of converging from two physical networks to one physical network, it's quickly overrun by the operational complexity you get by running all that traffic on a single infrastructure. Um, and again, most customers, especially large customers who invested in fiber channel historically, are very, very resistant to the notion of tampering with and taking undue risk in that part of the network. Yeah, don't touch my sand. Yeah, exactly. I'll kill you. Yeah. How, does, how does the EMC now, this new program that they're running, which obviously their channel, their investment's pretty high, and Jeremy was on talking about the vision. It's pretty solid. Yeah. They're listening to the channel, which if you don't listen to the channel, they'll burn you, because uh, they want to make money, as I always say. Dave always points out, the channel wants to make money. So how are you guys driving that through with EMC in terms of getting the mind share of the channel? Because channel's about money, but to get there, them to make you money and them money, you got to get their mind share. Sure. So what are you guys doing to get the mind share of the channel partners in the solution? Sure. Partners? Well, first of all, I think from a brocade point of view, participating in these kinds of initiatives and these kind of solutions gives us a lot of credibility and, and good tailwind as a result of some of the partnerships that we're bringing uh, as part of all this. But obviously, you have to put some more money in the channel partner's pocket. You have to have programs. You have to have incentives. You have to have a reason for them to want to go there. Um, again, I think this particular offer um, feeds the appetite for channel partners to reinvest in their opportunity to consult to the customer and not just sell them a fully integrated SKU like you might get with some of these you know, fully converged infrastructures. So I think there's a great opportunity to bring channel partners back into the fold uh, and give them that service, that consultative opportunity and, and uh, participate in that, in that part of the space. Excellent. Thanks. Jason, well listen, uh, thanks very much for coming inside theCUBE, sharing My pleasure. your perspectives awesome. about uh, Brocade and converged infrastructure. We'll see you around the, 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 the shows, I'm sure. EMC World. Hope to do it again. I'll be at EMC World. Yeah, well, we have theCUBE there as again. well. We had, uh, we had Mr. Clayco on there last year. He, uh, he seemed to enjoy it, so we'd love awesome. to have him back. So. Fantastic. All right. All right, thanks okay. guys. All right, thanks. thanks. Okay, we'll be right back with our next interview in, in, after this short break. And finally, let's go out to Utah, where EMC's newest state-of-the-art global technical support center officially opened last month. 
The ceremony was attended by EMC President and COO for Computing Infrastructure and Cloud Services, Howard Elias, and Utah Governor Gary Herbert. The 25,000 square foot center will serve federal agencies and companies desiring U.S.-based services, as well as Central and South American companies requiring Spanish and Portuguese language support for their information technology needs. The facility has been operating since December and expects to employ about 500 people with high-tech and customer service skills from Utah's skilled IT workforce by the year 2015. Thank you so much for being here. I can't tell you how excited I am about today's events. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, a wonderful opportunity for us to celebrate uh, the opening of our newest technology support center. Maybe it's the pioneer spirit of Utah. You know, we know how to work hard and uh, put in an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. And our production is uh, really a very good from our labor force. We are, in fact, high-tech savvy. I'm Connor Lamalfa. I'm a level one uh, technical support engineer with the Clarion team. I, I like the satisfaction of helping someone, whether it be uh, fixing, fixing something, something that's broken or, um, you know, helping them solve an issue, which, which they're in trouble with. I enjoy helping the customer. By locating our newest customer support center here in Draper City, EMC is demonstrating not only our commitment to world-class customer support, but also to creating good jobs and strong career opportunities here in the United States, enabled by our growth worldwide. My name is Gavin Heenan. I'm a technical support manager currently managing the Symmetric Support Team here in Utah. You know, when they announced the Technical Sports Center opening up in Utah, I immediately thought of the opportunities for both myself from a career perspective and also the opportunities for my family. I thought it would be exciting for them and also to get involved at the very early stages of, it, of the start of the Technical Sports Center. I thought it would be really exciting. The skilled workforce and favorable business climate, along with Utah's location and linguistic capabilities, allow EMC to better support the unique requirements of our uh, customers of all stripes, from the U.S. federal government, our growing base of customers here in the U.S., throughout the Americas, and across the globe. My name is Emerson Senna. Uh, I work as a technical support engineer, too, here at MEC, on a product called Clarion. As I'm a Brazilian, I speak Portuguese as my first language, and Utah is the main center for multilingual support. So I never thought I would have opportunity to speak Portuguese living in America and that has been great for me. EMC also intends to be an active participant in Utah's business community and to help provide students of all ages in Utah with valuable career skills that are in demand in today's high-tech economy. To this end, our academic alliance works with more than 750 colleges and universities worldwide including here in Utah, to prepare students for information technology-based professional roles that didn't even exist a few years ago, roles such as a cloud architect and a data scientist. So I congratulate you all for the work that's being done, for the results you're, you're providing for us, for the future optimism that you bring. You are the example of that hope that we all have here and living the American dream, and we're doing it here in Utah.